All right. Welcome. As Martin said, first of all, thank you very much, software leader, for inviting me to do this talk. I don't need the microphone here because clearly I think everyone in the back can hear me. I have a loud voice, as my uh, sons will uh, often complain about. So much to their chagrin, right? Me, my name is Michael Montgomery. My nickname is Monty. All my friends call me Monty. Please feel free to call, uh, use my nickname. I've been doing this a really long time. I look younger than I am, and I feel older than I should. <laughs> so I have some experience with what I'll share with you this evening. The most relevant uh, bullets on this slide are the fact that I have owned multiple iDesign informed systems through the full SDLC into production. So that is the key. You don't earn your stripes unless your architecture survives into code and your code survives into production. That's what you get paid to do. Put bits in the marketplace. So if it never happens, you can never really call yourself an architect. So the other relevant thing here is down at the bottom, actually, I think, is once you get to a certain point in your career, you should go out into your, uh, in your uh, community, public community near where you live, and uh, you know, engage with the community. I happen to live in Philadelphia in the United States, and there just happens to be, it's centrally located between four states, and when they do a code camp, it's like a national event. So I, I've been blessed to have such an incredible local community in the .NET space, and I'm known there for coming to the code camp and talking design. So I, the first slide when I go to present there, says straight out what? No code. So here, we're going to talk design. The agenda is pretty straightforward. We got a level set on our understanding of DDD, just a really brief recap, because it's relevant to the architectural um, evolution that I observed. We're actually going to just, I'm just going to share with you a case study. I observed this in, a, in the industry, and the names have changed to protect the innocent, but this is exactly what I observed with real teams uh, before I even in, uh, got involved and then after I was part of the team. I call them the little team that could because they were the one team who started to change some of the architecture based on the problems that they were finding. We're going to explore one feature in the, uh, the insurance domain, create a quote, okay? Anyone in the insurance domain? No? You can imagine it seemingly, when you're outside the domain, everything seems seemingly simple, right? Except when you're in there and you know that those processes and flows are, there's dozens and dozens of steps. It's uh, incredibly complex. We're going to simplify that to only 13, but still it has 13 steps. And I'm going to chronicle this, the little team that could's exploits as they started to do what everyone else in the whole entire organization was doing and decided to start doing things a little bit differently. We're going to conclude with highlighting that the, our opinion is that with the iDesign method, you can go right there instead of this long, arduous iteration of solving problems as they occur. So let's do a quick recap. Everyone hopefully knows in the industry that DDD is domain-driven design. It's important to keep that in mind, right? Because you are driving the design of the architecture and the system from the domain. Now, what, is, what does it mean, domain? The domain is the actual business language of that particular um, business. That's where we start to analyze the domain through the language, right? Does it make sense to everyone? Sound familiar to the, your understanding of DDD? We establish a ubiquitous language for those aspects of the business, right? As a domain model. We start to establish a model of those terms and their relationships, right? So we start to model the business using the language, 
and starting to identify the relationships between those terms. In a large system, it has a very large domain model. So that becomes untenable to manage over time as an artifact. So the idea is to break that larger domain into smaller bounded contexts. Each has its own ubiquitous language. So this is actually a well-known diagram um, from Mr. Fowler. And you can see these in this bounded context, there are certain terms from the domain that are unique, and then a few that are, that are the same. Or I mean, uh, some are different, excuse me, and some are the same. Of the ones that are the same within a bounded context, they have a different meaning, meaning that their model is different even though they have the same domain name. In support, customer has a different expression than in sales. So you guys still with me? Makes sense? In jives with your understanding of DDD to this point? You know, we're just doing the basics, right? So these are, each bounded context represents a subdomain. Some of the guiding principles of DDD, of course, is that each bounded context has ownership of its domain model. So it's a bounded context, after all. So that's the whole point of the bounded context, to try to avoid this leakage of abstractions that have different meanings across bounded contexts. That bounded context owns its submodel, which infers ownership of the data and logic that relates to that submodel. Okay, everyone's still with me. Every, I, I just checking. I want to make sure, you know, we're doing a basic recap, and that we're all on the same page, and that what I'm expressing is your general understanding of DDD. Everyone's nodding their head. Okay. <clears throat> As we can see in this diagram, almost by default, the bounded contexts by Conway's law, just start to naturally form around the divisional lines of the organization, right? That's well known. Generally in Conway's law, system structure follows the organizational structure, right? One little side note there, I'm sure all of the companies you work for are well architected. <laughs> so, what happens to your system architecture if your organizational structure isn't quite right? I'm just saying. So we've got two <laughs> divisions, sales and support, right? May all make sense so far. Within each bounded context we have in each subdomain, we also have what are called concepts, right? Each one of these boxes. So they themselves are a sub-model, right, in the subdomain. They're not just one single table, right? We're not really getting to that technical point yet. They could, they're usually non-trivial, particularly at this level. There's a lot of going on. There's an internal relationships even in each one of those blocks, right? We all get that. Each of those blocks with all that relationship, internal relationship, we call an aggregate root. Okay, all good. Then there is things that are common, these, these uh, shared concepts between bounded contexts. In this example, of course, customer and product. Each bounded context owns its own interpretation of the common concepts, right, as I mentioned before. Customer in sales, a different expression than customer in support. The design has to now express those common concepts. And as the diagram shows, that's where the two bounded contexts come in contact. So there's an integration now between the contexts. Somehow you have to map between these disparate uh, uh, expressions of the same concept, right? Which is interesting in of itself. 
you have to main consi uh, consistency, maintain consistency, excuse me, within the given bounded context. So you have to map between them. What comes out of that is a, is a concept called a context map, right? So now we're starting to go from this abstract domain model, subdividing it into bounded context by language, and now we're starting to see the word design emerge, hinting at certain architectural principles, right? Up to that point, we really hadn't talked about, we, we may not have even been talking about software. Now we're starting to hint, there's a relationship, there's integration. Now, now we're talking about more of a diagramic approach of highlighting how those contexts interrelate with each other. So just as a simple example of what might be going on, very common, billing is the one that actually owns the full customer expression. And then sales and support refer to that model with sub aspects of that model. Is this familiar to anyone in your own domain? This is commonly what happens. There's billing owns, you know, the financial portion of division of the system owns the canonical model for the customer. They own the customer, they have all the information, and then sales and support get you know, somewhat of a, a partial view of that overall uh, customer ex uh, expression. My own observations of this in the field, I have used DDD and I've been involved in many teams that have also been exploring, try to create archer, or architecture from a domain-driven uh, approach. There's a lot of ambiguity around what a domain is in the first place. Where, what, what is the definition of that domain? What are the subdomains in that domain? What are the submodels, the concepts? And where do we apply bounded context? across all those varying concepts. They are, teams end up finding it very challenging to discern those ideas and then transfer those into architecture. There's also, because of the, the unclear concept of what is exactly a given aspect, they have a hard time they start subdividing those concepts. So they'll take a domain, a subdomain, and they'll start increasing uh, the granularity of each, somewhat arbitrarily. So you start with a subdomain, you get into a concept, then you may split that concept thinking it's a subdomain. You start putting a bounded context around some of those smaller boxes. And you know every team potentially ends up with its own interpretation which you know, really erodes consistency and repeatability, especially as I observed in a large uh, domain like insurance. Anyone have any contrary perspective on this? Anyone have shared experience on observing this happening or exist in a system and had to deal with this? I see a lot of sh sh uh, heads shaking, okay. <clears throat> I think there is incredible intrinsic value in deriving a ubiquitous language. You have to dispel the Tower of Babel between the business and engineering or development, or the way I like to put it, between the suits and the geeks, right? The architect role is generally the, the liaison between those two worlds. And you know the language is very different. So defining a common ground language-wise is incredibly valuable. Analyzing the domain is incredibly valuable. Meeting with the stakeholders so that you pin the whole idea grounded in the business is really valuable. Clarifying all the common concepts so you understand their relationship is extraordinarily valuable. But what about the system you have to build? So that's all upstream. We've got this uh, kind of abstract artifacts of analysis 
that really have little to do with building a distributed system. In classic OO, the expression of DDD was a business object. And that business object had both data and behavior, meaning it had a bunch of properties on it and a bunch of methods, right? Make sense? Sound familiar? And when we say behavior, we mean both uh, methods and, and potentially logic inside those methods. But what about now when we go to distributed computing and we start to do service orientation, which I like to say, of course, is the class that I'm teaching this week. Service orientation does not equal object orientation. And if you use OO to design your SO system, you inevitably end in an endless stream of anti-patterns, as we're going to explore. So what do we do now? In a smaller scope, at a different era, business objects worked, because all we had were fat clients jacked onto the database. Not so much anymore. Now we have this huge distributed system with all these requirements and expectations from the business for agility, scale, elasticity, reliability, resiliency, uh, disparate environments, all the way down from Raspberry Pi to the largest cloud environment. Be a business object isn't really going to solve that problem. So what is a service? Anyone have experience with DDD that, of the definition of a service? Anyone? And then on top of that, what happens when we introduce microservices? Where there is this notion that services are small, just by the term itself. Current guidance suggests that to get a deeper understanding of this, you should do something called event uh, storming which means you get together with all the stakeholders, you explore the processes of the business, you explore the workflows, and you identify domain events, which are significant actions that occur in the business process. What often happens is that those domain events in comparison to architecture are extraordinarily granular and should be considered internal aspects of the actual overall process. So that what happens now is we're joining what is called event-driven architecture, an architectural concept, with the analysis portion from DDD and trying to blend the two. Make sense so far? What you've experienced yourselves, yeah? When I observe teams that tried to do this, they end up trying to graft the event-driven architecture onto their DDD analysis with this arbitrary definition of microservices, right? So you've got what might be a really good DDD analysis from a domain perspective that now you're trying to morph into some kind of system architecture. So is a bounded context a microservice? Is an aggregate root a microservice? Is an API a microservice? Is a business object a microservice? Is a domain service a microservice? Or is even a domain event handler for a single message in the entire system a microservice? iDesign instead recommends that event storming, it's too uh, premature to use something as granular as event storming to derive your architecture. Event storming is what we call detailed design, which is what we're practicing this week. It's what goes in the boxes. It is not itself the architecture. If you try to use detailed design to inform your architecture, you're at a level of granularity that breaks a concept we call cost versus count. 
and there are two opposing uh, forces in play, the cost of building the uh, aspect and the cost of integrating the aspect. The microservice community is fond of highlighting that microservices are good. Why? Anyone? Because they're small, they're really inexpensive to build, which is true. But contrasted to the cost of integrating those small little things, that can be exorbitantly, if not cost prohibitive, to actually achieve. So somewhere there's a balance between a few really big things that are internally complex, the monolith, that you can't maintain over time, and a thousand little things that are really easy to build by themselves, but impossible to integrate over time. So where's the balance, and how do you achieve that balance? You certainly do not want to start with detailed design, because you're already in a really bad cost zone of hypergranularity. Now let's take a look at DDD for insurance. So we've got the insurance domain, large multinational uh, conglomerate. This is a very large organization, global. You can imagine the size. The initiative, you're laughing, you should be crying. The vaulted digital transformation. Dun, dun, dun. The mandate APIs. We must put an API over our AS400. Listen, this is insurance. You think I'm joking. There are domains, there are industries that are still dinosaurs. Healthcare, finance, in insurance, they're all still running that COBOL. COBOL. Not so much in distributed systems, but it could keep you uh, in, uh, in rich uh, perpetuity. All right, so you get the point. The architects in this organization, not architect, architects, because this is a really big organization, they get together, they naturally, unconsciously decide to create their bounded contexts by the divisions in the organization, right? Makes sense. Commercial, small business, personal, high net worth. This particular organization is the oldest um, insurance company in the United States. <laughs> and they, uh, they write policies for people that I never expected needed an insurance policy. Yet someone has to write that policy. It's pretty fascinating. Across all the regions globally, North America, Latin America, APAC, you get the point, right? So this is teams and upon teams upon teams, right? All doing digital transformation simultaneously and trying to do APIs all at the same time. The architects agree that a service is a domain service, right? And that each, do they've already been building like this stuff for decades, so they've got a bunch of business objects laying around. So we're just gonna make those business objects services. And just to remind you, that means that each domain service is an aggregate route plus a, load, a boatload of 20 years worth of business logic. And then, of course, we've got to be cool, so we're going to call each domain service a microservice, even though they're not really that micro. Yeah. So... <laughs> This, I've seen this happen so many times, I can't even tell you. Like, you're gonna reuse code. You've already got a business object. That's why I started with this, because this is gonna just be a reoccurring theme. I should just stand out on the street like this. <laughs> They'll lock me up for sure. If they don't lock me up after this uh, session, <laughs> the DDD uh, squad's gonna come get me. <laughs> All right. Each team started doing their analysis. Of course, in that kind of divisional approach, there's a lot of common concepts, right? Policy, quote, rate, claim, customer. I can go on and on forever, right? Some of them are unique, but most of them are within each bounded context of the divisional boundary are almost identical. 
using their rules that I showed you, they take their DDD uh, analysis, which of it, in of itself was extraordinarily valuable. Ubiquitous language for every division, all that understanding of the domain model, all that deep understanding of all the information, 20 years worth of, of insights. And they try to now make it a system architecture. They're trying to follow the mandate of APIs, and they're trying to follow the, their agreed DDD guidance. For each concept, they create, you know, of course, the logical table schema, right, from that model. They identify the aggregate root entities, all makes sense, and they bound that in a single domain service. They also identify all the common apps that they normally use and now that have to consume this API instead. So we've got commercial, you know, we've got the usual suspects of portals, customer, sales, agent, support, right? And we've got our domain services with their requisite domain models at the bottom, right? Small business, personal, you get the point. Have I misstated anything so far from your understanding? Does this really, is contrary to your general understanding? I see a lot of head shaking, yes, okay. I don't wanna misrepresent anything, but we're at the point now where I'm just, this is the case study. I'm just sharing what these teams did. The personal insurance team starts building the system. You know, all the requirements and the use cases from the BAs, prior art, you know, they've got 20 years, massive brownfield, all kinds of knowledge distilled in the code base, right, which is the only spec of truth, right? The code is the spec. And this is just a small smattering of the, of the, the business requirements that, that they came up with. We're just gonna look at one, create a quote. And as I mentioned in the beginning, we're gonna, T attenuate this thing for brevity because it goes much further beyond this. Including in the United States now, during a background check, what else do you think they had to check? Homeland Security Blacklist. It, it just keeps going from there. So we're just gonna focus on this set of 13 steps, right? You collect the initial uh, demographics. During that process, then you have to do a bunch of validation, a bunch of checks. Are they a returning customer? Do they have an existing quote? Have you already given them a quote? Do they have policy out already? Uh, are we making a change to their policy? You get the point, right? UW is what? Anyone know from the insurance space? Underwriters, Underwriters exactly. So now you've, got to, they, you've done your initial checking and if they're thumbs up on your initial checking, then you have to go through the whole process of making sure that all their reality jives with your underwriter. That's a whole separate set. So that's not just one thing. You get them all right, and then you can imagine it's like a wizard experience in the user, in the UI and customer experience to go through that whole quizlet. And then you get all those answers back. And then you collect the answers and you analyze the answers and applying the rules and, and checking for claims and doing everything else is also potentially an iterative thing, not just one step. So there's a bunch of sub steps in here. Now, if I'm going to, what, I'm, what you're going to see next is my general attempt at, at modeling this diagramically to just try to highlight what, what they did. Now, I couldn't put all the arrows on there, but what I'm attempting to express is that they, every step, they made an endpoint on the API, every step. And then they called everyone from the browser. You guys are laughing. Tell me that your API is not exactly like that. You're shaking your head no. It's not like that at all? No. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I, I have, over the last 15 years, I've probably analyzed 50 systems, 
what did their APIs look like? Every single one was the same. So I have now, I feel, the broadest, broad enough statistical base to say with authority that your APIs are not, I, I'm trying to choose my words, they're not good, let's put it that way. <laughs> Listen, this is a family show. Anyway, now the relevant thing here is what? The most interesting thing with what they did first, because we're, we're saying create a quote, right? Now, I'm not saying this is the right thing to do. I'm just saying this is what they did. What do you see here? Everything goes to what? The quote domain service. Everything. Even though that like a majority of these steps don't have anything to do with quotes. But it was called create a quote. So that's the domain term. So it has to resolve to the create uh, the quote domain service, right? Right. So literally, this is what they built in, or started to build in the very beginning. Does this look familiar to anyone? No, no one has a system that even remotely looks like this at all. No, no. It might even look better than this because they don't even have the yellow box and all the codes in the gateway. Tell me that you don't have any code in the gateway. Tell me your API isn't the fat app of old. I'm willing to bet a lot of money if you let me do a code base, uh, just a little perusal. I know what I'll find. So what happens, attempts to satisfy, just bloat the domain service, right? Or like, quote, they called it a microservice. It's micro. It has to know about all this, the other models as well, contains all the logic for all those 13 steps. They're, n they're completely eroding any hope of cohesion with this first step. They also are breaking the principles of uh, sole ownership. So iDesign calls this design the God service, right? And even though that with their best, best efforts, what does this really smell like? So uh, that's why we did the pendulum swing, right? We just didn't meditate on the middle. The big, really big thing over here wasn't good, so we turned 180 degrees and ran into that wall for hypergranularity. And then as you've been watching this whole thing unfold over the last five or six years, what have we done? We turned 180 degrees and run into this wall and then we run in 180 degrees and hit that wall. And then over an excruciating long period of time of flattening your face, you'll end up in the middle somewhere. It's human nature. Don't ask me. I'm just human. It just fascinates me that we are so knee-jerk that we will run in the opposite direction instead of meditating on the middle. Why? What does meditation take? Time patience and silence. Do you have any of that at work? No, of course not. Now, the little team that could decides mid-iteration, the, the architect's like, yeah, this ain't gonna work. Now, why does this really not work? It says portal up there, but if what if I were to put mobile? Everyone knows, right, that the cell network is by far still, even though they try to say otherwise, the slowest part of the network. And if you know anything about cell tech, cell tech itself between your phone and the tower is already incredibly chatty. So if you put chatty application over chatty protocol, it doesn't end well. So if you've ever wondered why your mobile app is slow, that might be why. It's not because you have a bad connection. So they bite the bullet. The architect calls for a design refactor. This isn't just refactoring the code. This is refactoring the design, right? That's pretty ballsy. Bold, I apologize. 
<laughs> they, they want to reapply the principles of sole ownership, right? So he recognizes this. Meanwhile, the rest of the teams, as far as I know from historical evidence and firsthand experience, didn't just kept on cr cruising through this, right? So the other teams are just cranking away. Personal insurance team, George, actually changes his mind. So now they're going to re try to redouble down on this and then declare that the, the gateway has to interact with, go back to interacting with each appropriate domain service, both for the data and for the logic. In addition to this, since they're still trying to move forward in the middle of doing a design redux midstream, anyone ever have to do that? Yeah, that's a lot of fun. Trying to fudge, oh yeah, it'll be done uh, soon. Other things come into play that they also have to deal with. Underwriting questions, underwriting rules, limits, billing. You get the point, right? At this moment, the architects, this architect in this really big organization is saying, listen guys, I think we made a misstep with this. You guys should also do a redux. Again, little team that could is the only one that actually decided. It was pretty crazy for them to even contemplate this given the business pressure, right? So you've got to be bold to make them play like this midstream. So this is what they did. The question of course, have they really solved any problem or just moved it around. What was that? Yes, they just distributed it, yeah. So in one way, it does somewhat become, a you know, that's the whole microservice thing, right? This is the, this is the, this is the right side of cost versus count. If you imagine the left side is the cost of building and the right side is the cost of integration, now we just went from one side to the other, right? without even, we just went right through the middle to the other extreme. Now, we gotta send some emails. Sound familiar? <laughs> SMS, e-delivery, right? So this is insurance, so we have to make, a, uh, make, it sure, make sure that the delivery of documentation secure, they have to sign it securely, all that good stuff, right? They all become microservices as well. Tell me that your system isn't like this. Please, please tell me. Of course, once you get to this point and the gateway has all the code, <laughs> you've got some problems you have to deal with, right? Now the orchestration, you know, that evil orchestration word becomes a, a problem. And each one is hard coded for the specific application. Don't forget, this is only the customer portal. And now all that orchestration, all those little bits of integration are all now smeared across the app. Some's in the app, some's in the API, and now some's in the microservice themselves. And now you have to duplicate that across every app. So you got the sales portal, you got the support portal, you got the agent portal. Does it look familiar? Now, at some point someone might say, oh, we gotta get the code out of the, the gateway. We gotta put a web API in place, right? At least it solves that problem. So if there's one thing you learned from this session, please don't put any code in your gateway. What is the gateway for? Anyone? Security. It is the security boundary between you and that crazy thing called the internet. Nothing else. So this isn't a bad play if it solves problems, right? You should segregate your gateway from the web API. But in this case, they just added a layer. So this didn't really fix anything. And then they have, of course, the web API for all four applications. The team starts to move forward, many more orchestrations, right? This is the challenge. There's always these sequences. 
work, the user's driving a bunch of sequence of workflows, the system's driving flows. There's endless variation in those flows by you know, the type of, the age of, of the, the customer. Are they, are they married? Are they not? Like you can just see the if else from hell emerging, right? You know what it is because there's just endless variation. There is no ubiquitous, we have a ubiquitous language, but we don't have a ubiquitous created quote. So now what? There's no one microservice that encapsulates all this. Each orchestration relies on many microservices. And then unfortunately, the subdomains start to get smeared between the layers. And everything is hard coded at one layer or the other, either at the front end in the JavaScript, in the web API, or in some combination of the services and the in intermediate layers. Right? Now, let's just amp up the fun. This is just web. What happens when you add phone, mobile, tablet? Are those the only clients these days? What are the other clients we have? Your watch, that's mobile though. But there's two other variants that are truly unique and different. What's that? VR, perhaps. That's a different one I hadn't thought of. But there's two more common ones, chat and IVR. So voice flows and chat flows, right? They're extraordinarily common. They're all flows at the end of the day. They're all clients driving the same thing. You could get on the phone and maybe do the initial steps of creating a quote. So let's add that. We got the phone, tablet, voice, chat. You hear where we're heading, right? This, tell me this is not the way you write software. No? <laughs> tell me this is not the way the industry writes software. Please, please tell me. Now, on top of that, we're going to add the BFF, the back end for front end pattern. This means that your web API should be honed towards the form factor of the client. Right, so I'm collapsing some of the layers now just for brevity, but now we've got a tablet web API, phone, voice, chat, right? Are we done? No, What's, what, what did we forget? We got all the portals too. I can tell by the way that you're laughing with a tragic comic intent that it is really an admittance of guilt. All right. Now, just a little aside, iDesign recommends, I, the BFF pattern is, is good, is good stuff. But doing this, I don't think when you consider engineering and cost versus count, you end up in a bad cost zone with APIs. So what if we instead create a BFF by application type? Because it is after all, customer phone, sales phone, agent phone, and support phone, right? Same with the other ones. We have better ways circa 2023 to solve that problem than to duplicate deployable elements. So at least it gets because, and the reason for that is cohesion. They are still customer use cases. They are still support use cases. The form factor is a secondary artifact. Now it's important because you better not be shipping the canonical customer to the phone, or you better not be shipping the, web, the website to the phone or I'm gonna refuse to use it. 
because that's impossible. I can't even see it. And no, responsive design does not cut it. So eventually everyone goes native whether you like it or not, right? So you have to deal with those things. So form factor absolutely impacts your detailed design, but perhaps not your architecture. And of course, minimal code in the web API. So the guys that took the class today, they saw this firsthand. Ideally one line of code in your, in your controller. This is better, not ideal, but at least we're starting to constrain some of the coupling, right? At this point, the team realizes that each feature is a complex flow, right? Go figure. Doing it per endpoint produces these extraordinarily chatty interactions. Again, over the slowest part of the network. And then they do a little more analysis and they realize that not all the interactions need to be external because they're not user initiated. As they keep building, they start to observe that the feature, everything's the same. There's all this endless variation after doing numerous stories. They start to identify all the variation only after coding begins, right? Which is the cheapest way to do it. All the variance in the business process, all the variance in the flows, all the variance in the steps in the orchestration even. It could be the same use case, but yet maybe for a certain thing, there's endless variation in the steps. Maybe we have to do the underwriting first because of some special condition, and then we have to check things last, or we have to check the Homeland Security blacklist first. Maybe in this case, it's last. You, you guys have lived through that. You are living through this now, right? Problem is that none of this is normally caught during design time. It's only after you start building it that you start feeling the pain. And that's where, unfortunately, there's a lot of refactoring going on to the point where the industry thinks it's natural. It's not natural. And the business, that's why they don't like us, because it's extraordinarily expensive and time consuming. Now, here we're going to, I've been using a term that I didn't qualify because it's incredibly overloaded. And it's overloaded because the business has one meaning of use case and techies have a different meaning of use case. So we're going to level set on that. We're going to say now from this point forward that a use case in this simple context is a user initiated interaction with the back end. Okay. So it's not the full create a quote, but it is a user initiated step, you know, in that flow. Because that's really the only ones we have to consider. Ideally, all those other steps that they were initiating from the client should be where? They're just on the back end. Why force them from the front end? Again, the other issue is there's all this variation and no one microservice encapsulating. It. The flows, the use cases, the orchestrations. So again, at the bottom, there's no real clear direction for the teams. Many teams just assume they're creating hyper granular APIs. They don't talk to anyone. They throw the API over the wall and it's the build it and they will come anti-pattern. There's a movie in the United States called Field of Dreams, right? They cut down all the corn and they build a baseball field and the ghosts come out of the corn. Yeah, okay. Anyone ever deal with this? So the teams just assume there's going to be some kind of magic uh, external uh, coordinator going on here. And it could be anywhere. It could be the mythical you know, ghost of the client, the mythical ghost of the gateway, right? Yeah, it just works. <laughs> Worked on my desk. <laughs> the other problem is coding up each variance becomes incredibly time consuming and buggy. And the code, non-trivial code, gets smeared across the, the client, the gateway, 
the web API, or all of them. Because it's all kind of smeared around and locked up, you can't reuse it across the other user experience contexts. Again, don't put any code in the web API in the gateway. And every time a sequence changes, they all have to change. And you have to redeploy it all. How many of you are re redeploying the entire mountain of bits every single time without any granular deployment? Anyone? I know a lot of you are. At this point, trying to solve some of these problems, the current guidance suggests that you might try choreography over uh, orchestration. Well, choreography means, if you think about it, it's like everyone doing their own thing in parallel, and then at some point in time, we're going to come back together and, and be back in lockstep, right? So the idea is that you send out a bunch of par parallel steps as events, and some other thing is going to reorganize all the results as separate events coming back and uh, coordinate them. This, in certain circumstances, is a really powerful pattern, but perhaps not to run your general business transactions against. This is generally a, uh, analogous to a really powerful pattern called scatter gather. That's really good for things that don't have to take, no one's waiting for, and that don't have that can take an indeterminate amount of time. Because the, and ideally, the things do not have to be coordinated together because they're autonomous. Like the messages in 100 million transactions, you can just run them all in parallel because they don't have any bearing on each other. True of create a quote at all. So trying to do this with a business flow becomes really arduous. iDesign ultimately suggests that you need both. You need orchestration and you need choreography. But with the idea of engineering in mind, you should constrain each to specific parts of the architecture. Perhaps choreography becomes so untenable that maybe you should constrain it to a very specific part in the architecture and only do it for very specific reasons. Now, each context, we go back to the whole entire organization and they're all doing the same thing. Each context requires all these nuances. What we're going to establish as a technical term is that that use case as a signal in, uh, user initiated interaction with the backend and the orchestration that results from that is also business logic. In fact, it's the most what you might consider volatile business logic in the whole system because it changes all the time, the sequence of what the user needs to do and why. You know, all you guys all uh, shook your head yes when you, you just imagine create a quote with all the nuance of the variation by the age of the customer, whether they're married, you know, I mean, I could just go, we could go on forever with the, the potentially infinite variation of those flows. So what we're doing now is suggesting that with this use case though and the identification of breaking create a quote into only the user initiated actions, we might be able to start constraining things and uh, limit the, inter the interactions with the backend and maybe improve the reusability. So the idea here is never orchestrate from the gateway, the web API, or worst of all, the client, never. So now that we're thinking that we need to encapsulate the orchestration, we need something to encapsulate it. We are still doing a system architecture. We, it feels like maybe we deviated from that, but we do have to deliver a highly scalable, elastic, distributed API for our digital transformation. Is that enough? <laughs> Using microservices and every other um, hot button term you can think of. So again, what we're trying to also do is potentially promote reuse, 
and ideally autonomous. Current guidance suggests this literally just started to appear in some guidance out of nowhere. It's called the aggregator service. Anyone heard of this? Some of you are shaking your head yes. This is the service that now is supposed to encapsulate the use case orchestration. This, I think, is a pretty good idea. Except, is it the right pattern? Is it really aggregating, or is it doing something else? Anyone want to suggest a different pattern that might be more appropriate? Anyone? You don't want to say it. You have, you'll wait for the end, okay. You'll wait for the punchline. Anyone else? The what? The God service. We'll get to that, yeah. I'm not saying this is ideal, but this is certainly better, right? So we have one place to start encapsulating all that variation. But think, I know it will date me horribly, but there are seminal books in this industry that you should just study. What do you think I'm referring to? The Gang of Four. Those patterns are so foundational, you should just know them like the back of your hand. Aggregator is valid in certain circumstances, but this is not doing aggregation because it has these calls. But it's at least keeping them segregated from each other so they don't necessarily have to know about each other. So that's a good thing. There's another pattern that when you read the Gang of Four, that's exactly what it says. It's the mediator. So this is actually a mediator. And if you read the Gang of Four definition of the mediator pattern, it just says, make multiple calls to objects so that mediate the calls to multiple objects so you don't have to couple each one, each them together, right? It's pretty straightforward. So this is what iDesign agrees. This is a really good idea. We're not done yet but we're, getting, we're starting to walk towards where I think a better place to live. At this time, they start doing their analysis. They see the user-initiated steps. There's actually only three user-initiated steps out of all the 13. And they want to refactor it into a flow so that they can leverage that independently and create variations. So we break this down into what was the 13 into the three user initiated steps. I'm not saying this is the only thing you can do, but this is, this is a good start for trying to avoid the, the chattiness. So we collect the initial demographics, right? We go back to the back end, do a bunch of analysis. That does not all have to be orchestrated from out from the internet or over the gateway or anything like that, right? So then we have the flow as quote pre-check as a use case now. This is our check before we hand it off to try to make sure that their reality lines up with the underwriter, underwriter's reality, right? So that's one step. Then we've got the whole sequence of lining it up with the underwriter. Whether we have these, there's little details here. This is an interesting problem because sometimes they publish the questions. Sometimes you have to go to their API, right? You get the point. And then the final analysis of all the answers, collecting it, maybe running machine learning. It could be arbitrarily complex over here in this last step before you give back the magic answer. Okay, so now what we've done is partitioned what was otherwise this hyper chatty interaction into three calls and done the rest of it on the other side of the wire where it's dramatically more efficient. This only happens when you start to analyze this problem space 
by the actual behavior of the system, the required behavior of the system, not by the domain. The domain is not going to tell you to do this. Use case analysis is going to start hinting that the variation, after you look at a few, you can get the sense that the variations in these flows may be infinite. So now this new problem emerges that maybe you didn't see before. This new, you know, what iDesign calls a new volatility. And they all not only vary by use case, they vary by application type. Because do you think the agent's created quote is the same as your created quote online? Of course not. Do you think support created quote is the same as the sales created quote as the same as support? You, know, you, you get the point, right? So there's this endless variation. If we try to express that in services, that is, I always wondered how uh, teams ended up with a thousand microservices. And then you start looking at this and you start to see, well, yeah, I mean, if you make every single one of these things a service, then yes, indeed, you would have a thousand of them. So now we've got the customer portal pre-check. The customer phone pre-check. Did you notice there's a certain theme here? Can you tell the difference other than the, than the title changing? We're starting to get closer to something that's manageable, right? Because these blocks, to some degree, with the mediator and the sequencing, can handle all the variation. However, you knew it was coming, right? It's a if-else switch statement from hell. All that variation in that mediator service, so yes, we just recast the God service in a new form, right? So we have better ways circa 2023 to solve these problems than coding up all these variations. So we start to contemplate adding a workflow engine in, into the mix. Start to extract out the mediation, separate strategies. This team actually hand rolled theirs because the flows weren't that complicated. The, the steps were all different, but the complexity in what they needed to do wasn't all that complex. So they didn't need a big BPM to do all this, right? You can still get away with putting in the right thing necessarily without having to buy some monstrous platform. They started to do, they pull them out though, they write them in simple, in this case, they wrote them in XML at that time. They could load them up, hinting by context, right? Now we're talking about a different type of context, the application and form factor context. And so we flow that, we can load up the appropriate sequence and we can execute it across the existing set of services. You can you switch that from a code problem into a configuration problem. Now you still have to version them, you still have to test them, it's all the same, but it becomes more manageable when you don't have to continually change the code every time. And you don't need the big heavy BPM in all circumstances, right? You can get started very easily with this kind of technique. Flow the headers, translate that into context on the calls uh, underneath the mediator. And then everyone knows what the context is. You could even start loading up custom code in the policy engine or policy uh, service, for example, right? Strategy pattern is another foundational pattern in the gang of four. There's only a handful that are super valuable. Anyone know what the most valuable one is now that every single framework you use uses? Anyone? It's the way to solve open closed. Anyone know what that pattern is? The decorator, incredibly powerful. All right, so now we're gonna add that into our, now we're, we're talking, this is becoming more and more like a blueprint. Something we could actually build, give to the devs to build as an abstraction. I'm gonna say now that those portal use cases are out there in the cache 
simple sequences that we can load up, hinted by the context of the originator of the request. Okay. This is a highlight that some of them, like the agent, may have variations. So the very we have the requisite blocks. Now we can just start varying them, right? Now, there's a boatload of logic still from 20 years of experience in each one of these, as well as the management of this domain model. What if I want to reuse that? Right? Without, and maybe version it and deploy it independently from this guy. The team starts recognizing the value in doing that. And they want to avoid the redundant code that was still existing in some of the domain services. And they want to, they want to aggregate it together. So there's accessors for the database, third party APIs, files, other resources all jacked into there. There's a bunch of logic also jacked into all those different domain services. So we start breaking it out. We divide the data interactions from the logic interactions so that we can reuse them independently. But this is still creating a problem, right? Because we've got even transforms there as well because this is a really common thing. You've got a map between certain things. Transformation is actually more evolved than a mapping. A simple mapping would be preferred, but transformation actually involves a bunch of logic. Non-trivial business logic when you've got to transform something and you've got to change the properties, not just map the property from one uh, or the value from one property to the other, but you actually have to transform it as well. This created just an explosion of services, right? Now you've got even more as you try to break these things out and reuse them. Right, so this is probably starting, we're just creating a new problem. There's a desire here to break these things out, but this isn't solving the problem. But there is some consistency here that we can see now, right? What if we started to look at all those redundant things as potentially just an aspect of the same thing, right? We can still load things up, but we dramatically reduce the deployment footprint. They're still autonomous. We can still take the implementations by the strategy pattern, deploy them together, reduce our footprint. We still have, you know, so we're getting closer to the middle. We have less of an integration concern, management concern, and we're switching that so that they're encapsulated now instead of smeared as separate microservices. You can consolidate the things that are similar by a new criteria for a single responsibility. We use that interesting term volatility. So if you Google volatility, there's an 11 word definition that sums up our industry. The liability for something to change unexpectedly and rapidly, especially for the worse. It literally says that. Sound familiar? So people have a hard time grokking volatility. It's so evident that they're blind to it because it's right in their face. It's the industry we, we work in. Every word is meaningful, but my favorite is the comma, space, especially for the worse. So we also want to, this is a hint towards construction, which the, which the class has been practicing all week. Interface segregation is more of a detail of detailed design and construction, but we also want to start thinking about those as well as we're doing the architecture. The differentiation may come out as separate interfaces, what iDesign calls a facet of system behavior. And this is detail, detailed design, as I mentioned, what goes in the boxes. 
oh, I had it in here. I didn't think I put it in here. So this is literal. Oxford, it's an Oxford definition, right? So it's got to be good. I like that they underlined, uh, or, or that, that unpredictability is, a, is, a, is, out of all the words, the one that's a link. All right, so you get the point. So we take all the logic, which largely was a bunch of different variations of validation rules, and we group those together. We still do the strategy pattern in there, so they're all still differentiated. It's really not a fat service anymore. You could still break it out if you wanted to. But we're starting to get closer to the sweet spot between one giant monstrosity and a bunch of little things, right? We do the same thing for transforms. And now the domain service starts to look more approachable. It is responsible for this model. And it produces, among other sub aspects, the aggregate root. But we took all the logic out of the business object, transforms validation. It's, these are just rudimentary examples. Anyone have questions? Call bullshit on this? Get a sense that we're getting to something a little tighter than what we had before. When you start driving the analysis by the use cases, by the, by the runtime behavior of the system, the architect, the, what comes out of the architecture is materially different than decomposing the system by either simply the domain model, the feature itself, or the functions. So now you can start to visualize it more straightforwardly and then implement it. The team understands where to put the rules, how to express the rule sets as variations based on you know, the arbitrary uh, axes of volatility, could be a number of different things. We're getting all those little if statements out of the code so we can change them more easily. I'm not saying that rule expressions are the solution for everything, but there's a bulk set of logic that are easily expressed by rudimentary expressions that you can easily do with a rules engine. The thing I like to point out to teams is that business logic is often not these really complex algorithms or really involved um, calculations. There, we do have that. It's a death by a thousand cuts. It's last name, comma, space, middle initial, period, space, first name. It's first name, space, last name. It's last name, comma, first name. You get my point, right? That's business logic. If you don't get that right, your report doesn't work. Your AI doesn't work either. Your metrics don't work. How many, you, you know that that's smeared across the entire code base from the JavaScript into T-SQL. I know it is. It's a death by a thousand cuts. Now, at this point, I had started working with the team a little before this. I was very surprised when I come into an organization and find someone crazy enough to hand roll their own workflow engine, aside from me. <laughs> it's not as hard as you would think, shockingly. But it does help to study the industry and understand how they work. And maybe by distilling the mystery that is a workflow engine, you might realize they're really not that complex at all. And you could probably write one in 100 lines of code. I'm not joking. It's not that hard. And you could just get started by solving some of these problems with some rudimentary elbow grease, just like this team did. And I was very impressed by that because I rarely come across someone who's willing, you know, who hasn't paid an extraordinarily license for BizTalk, for instance which is now defunct, of course, but that was my favorite thing during the time is that every, oh my God, we paid so much for BizTalk, you have to use it. We don't need BizTalk, you have to use it. We're in the cloud, you have to use it. But it's on-prem, you have to use it. That, I, I witnessed that conversation. 
I'm not joking. <coughs> iDesign suggests that we should introduce a new design metaphor. So in the midst of all this, an attempt to actually start encapsulating the things that change, we not only need to encapsulate the things, but we have to identify how the team should encapsulate them so that we promote consistency, repeatability, that ultimately engenders sustainability over time. So we're going to come up with a taxonomy. And with the taxonomy, then, you can start creating an ontology, uh, which is basically specific names of components using the generalized taxonomy. And we'll just throw in some roles, rules, and relationships so that we keep ourselves honest. And we're basically just exercising first principles of engineering. So iDesign method actually promotes and contains a ready-made taxonomy for the problem space, the average commercial or enterprise system. It's not for everything. It's not for IoT. It's not for actor designs. But it works really well over the last 25 years for your average commercial and enterprise system, which is most of what all of us are building. It uses the criteria of volatility to define why any given service exists. And then once you identify that service, then you give it a role based on the type of code that that volatility represents. The mediator is called the manager. The engine is the logic. Access is the accessor to external and third party resources. Utilities are the framework that we write. And then we have the physical resources and we have different variations. The taxonomy and the notation are purposely extraordinarily simple. Any kind of extra icons and images and, you know, flowery fluff on the diagram just makes it more difficult for the team to absorb. If the team can't absorb what you're, what you're laying down, they're never going to be able to act on it at all. So it has to be really simple and straightforward to absorb before they can actually um, adopt it. And then once they adopt it, and if it actually does something meaningful, better for, than what they were doing before, then they will start to advocate on, for it. So if we transfer what we just had into the iDesign method taxonomy so that every team produces the same result, because the interesting thing about the taxonomy is it's not problem specific. So every team can get up on the taxonomy using the same terminology and start to produce very similar architectures. And now we know what goes in the manager and how we're doing it, because right now, you know, we've pulled out the user experience flows. We know the validation engine is encapsulating the, all the volatility and variation of validation in this system using a rules engine as, an art, as, a, as a framework. Transformation loads up different transformations. We might have deployed hundreds of them uh, as separate binaries. We can version each binary separately, but the unit of scale and the unit of deployment is still encapsulates all that change without having each one be a variation deployed independently. We can still achieve all that business agility and, and handle all the variability without making every single thing a service. And now all the pre-checks come through the experience manager loads up the appropriate flow, and then executes across the existing blocks as appropriate. <coughs> when we start to abstract this, we can start to generalize it during design. So for all the customer interactions, regardless of form factor, they come through here. Or you can constrain it in your design so you can communicate this to the developers that say, only these clients actually 
interact with the experience manager. Customer related interaction comes through experience, agents and support go through a different uh, subsystem within the architecture because they're, you're not managing their experience. They have a materially different interaction with the system. In addition to all this, it's again, using volatility as the criteria for single responsibility. We promote more solid design. We increase the single responsibility, separation of concerns, and the rest of the solid design we honor in what we've been doing all this week in the detailed design. The important thing here is, of course, you can't throw the domain out. It still has to do all the things be relevant to the domain. We're just not using the domain as the architecture. We're driving the architecture analysis by the use cases, the runtime behavior of the system. Right. Context is also still incredibly re relevant, but it's relevant in the terms of the initiator of the request into the system, not an arbitrary boundary around the ubiquitous language. So when we abstract it out during, during design, we come up with something like this. And of course, we do the analysis informed by the domain relative to the context and driven by the use cases. If you had ran the, if this team had ran the iDesign method first, they would have come much closer to something like this. The net result is that from my experience, running the method gets you closer to where you eventually will arrive anyway after all this iteration and all the experimentation. You get there much quicker. Now, as an example, we translate into the method equivalent. Right, we have our access components, we have the validation, we have the transformation and our mediator, which for those particular customer related use cases manages the experience. And the resources, of course, the one thing if you remember from the taxonomy is the orange things are no sequel. Of course, the blue cylinders are traditional uh, relational models. And then the other uh, icon is for rule uh, for files. On the right side, we have a bunch of frameworks that are mitigating some complexity for the developers and enforcing policy. And then with more use case analysis comes out, we can fairly quickly flesh out the remainder of the volatilities in the architecture. So if we go back to our use cases, now we can use this design, and this is very close to something that, if not very close to something we can absolutely build. Validation uses quotes and claims. Customer access we get first because we need to inject it into all of these. We check for the el of eligibility based on their policy. We transform the result and we return it through the experience. Now the detail in the experience manager is something more advanced. We talked about this today with the class. It's what we call a workflow manager, which means that it's actually driving the customer or the, the customer experience. Basically like a state machine, the front end has all the views like a spa, but it's a dumb terminal. Starts up, sends a completion back to the back end that says, I am completed startup. Arbitrary logic in the back end determines what the next step is, might say, activate the login screen. Then you get the completion on the login screen, and then it goes to the first flow, whatever that is. Show me my home page. Show me an advertisement. You know, this is how most front ends work these days. <clears throat> but the key thing there is to get that logic, which itself is incredibly variable, out of the JavaScript and into the back end where it's much more complex instead of a bunch of chattiness back and forth. 
Any questions? Yes. And the email service, if you go one slide back, where would that belong on here? Good question. So it's a little beyond the this session. Uh, yeah, so the, there was a question about the email service. Where does that go? So there's a comms SDK. So now that becomes a utility on interfacing with the email uh, service. The notification subsystem is a separate volatility for sending all communications to all channels, just like my school district spams my whole entire house, everyone's phone, now that my kids are older, when there's a communications from the school, the phone, email, telephone, all of them light up simultaneously. All four of us get spammed at the same time. That's the beautiful volatility that is the notification manager. So there's a separate diagram for all of the interactions and call chains from all the, the remaining parts of this architecture that we would actually illustrate for the, for the uh, developers, excuse me, <coughs> which is a little beyond this session, but that's where email goes. Then there's a feed subsystem that would take the e-delivery, also the signatures, right? Isolating that security boundary. Administration, of course, is for all those low, uh, those easy use cases of, of, that someone has to administer all the data in the system, the reference data. Analysis, of course, is foundational because you better be analyzing all the, the process of the, of the system they want to know. <clears throat> Who completed the, the created quote? How far did they get? What each step happened? You know, all that good telemetry coming from the front end, all those things. But this is just one example of how we express that as a blueprint. And then detailed design goes inside those blocks. <coughs> if you're curious about these ideas, iDesign considers that the architect term and the architect role is somewhat inflated. What you really want to be is a design engineer. That's what we really need. You need to think design first, but in an engineering mindset. And that's what these kind of concepts come out of. We have architecture masterclass, or architect masterclass, excuse me, that lays out you know, iDesign's idea on how a design engineer actually operates. And you practice these concepts in, in hands-on clinics, in workshops, and other concepts. We also believe that you must also design the plan. The, you know, the Lego construction instructions for your project. You can't just hack at it arbitrarily. It doesn't end well. There's classes coming up. You can hit iDesign.net. We're doing one. I'm doing one in particular, the Architecture Clinic live again in uh, Philadelphia, near where I live, in the beginning of December. And Yuval's coming uh, to Zurich in November. You can also study these ideas through Yuval's book, Writing Software. It's really about bringing engineering first principles back to software. And you can find a bunch of webcasts, including this one, probably, on our YouTube channel. And there's a lot of other concepts in there around not only designing the system, designing the project, and our favorite concept actors. Everyone who's taking an iDesign or had taken an iDesign course understands that at a certain level in your career, soft skills become essential. So even the DDC, uh, we're, tomorrow is soft skills Thursday. So there's a lot of other aspects in there from the role of the architect or the design engineer through knowing your team. We also have a bunch of course code, some of it legacy, but it's worth studying for using more modern techniques. And 
of course, moving forward, dapper uh, supported framework bits to make the use and consumption of dapper a little easier. 